Hi and welcome back to The Wine School and this week we're back home in Great Britain uh, and we're looking at winemaking in the UK, uh, predominantly in England and Wales. The history of winemaking in these islands is fairly recent. It does date back to the Romans but they mainly imported wine from other parts of the empire. There's a little bit of evidence of winemaking but it's very small scale compared to their normal production with wine being a staple of the Roman diet. Uh, there was a little bit of wine made by the monasteries uh, throughout the time that they were powerful in the UK, but that was mainly for communion wine. It was more for sacramental purposes rather than, than drinking. Uh, the reason we've been so involved in the UK, as we've talked about in previous episodes, with winemaking in Bordeaux, Madeira, Portugal as a whole, is simply because we don't have any real capacity for production ourselves until recently. The modern industry was kick-started in the 1950s. Uh, there'd been a few sort of amateur vineyards before then, some with relatively modest plantings, but it was in the 1950s, just down the road from here in Oxted and Surrey, uh, that a chap called Barrington Brock set up a viticultural research centre. And it was important because even though it was a little bit too high in altitude, a little bit too cold, he did prove back in the 1950s that you could ripen wine grapes here in the UK, uh, if only in the southern half of the country, in Surrey. The earliest commercial growers uh, were Jack Ward in Sussex and the gloriously named retired soldier and diplomat, Major General Sir Guy Salisbury Jones, uh, who had, he was a great Francophile, he was a diplomat to France, uh, he had associations with Paul Roger, they actually in helped him set up his vineyards at Hambledon in Hampshire. Um, and so he was a real force for believing in the wine trade in, or wine making in the UK at a very early stage. At that time uh, he was advised by Paul Roger to plant Seval Blanc. He had lovely chalky soil in his Hampshire vineyard, lovely aspect below the house of the slope of the vineyard. Uh, and Seval Blanc can make a good wine. There's, there's one modern British winemaker I've heard describing it as cabbage and raw potato which is a little unfair. It does taste like that if it's unripe, but we can ripen it properly now and it does make a fairly decent wine uh, with a little residual sugar. Sparkling wine in the champagne mould is what we do really well in the UK. Uh, we're particularly well suited to it for several reasons I'll come on to. And I find it really interesting that we were, until recently, the biggest export market for champagne. We've slipped into number two behind the USA, just as our own production in the UK is actually in increasing I don't think there's a direct correlation between it, but I think it's fantastic that we're drinking so much more of our own product. One historic peculiarity, because champagne is so dominant in the market, is that everyone focuses on Dom Perignon as the father of champagne. And yes, he is, and he really refined a lot of the techniques, but actually the, the second fermentation in bottle was discovered or rediscovered more accurately by Christopher Merritt. He did a demonstration to the Royal Society in 1662, which was eight years before Dom Perignon says he perfected the champagne method, the second fermentation in bottle. Uh, Christopher Merritt actually got the idea from cider makers in the West Country by putting a bit of lump sugar in the wine, recorking it, the second fermentation, then repressurized and made the wine fizzy, um, which is what we now know as the second fermentation, which makes good quality traditional method sparkling wine. Moreover, it was the stronger glass that we had in the UK that made this possible. The French even called it le verre anglaise. Because we had a shortage of wood in this country, we fired our glass with coal, which burns much hotter. It makes much stronger glass, which is what you need. This bottle here, until it was opened, had seven atmospheres pressure in it, which is, is quite high. If you drop one of these on a concrete floor, it explodes like a grenade. Uh, so you need strong glass to keep it in. Quite a few people in the early days of champagne production were killed. Uh, you'd often have to go down into a champagne cellar with an iron mask on to protect yourself from the odd exploding bottle. Although the um, earlier invention of Christopher Merritt uh, is historically accurate, uh, it does belie the fact that sparkling wine was made across France much earlier than Dom Perignon or Christopher Merritt. Uh, but it's a nice, I feel, because one of Champagne's strongest assets is its brand identity, it would be great if English sparkling wine had a name to go on along the same lines, but you can't, it doesn't roll off the tongue to say it can have a glass of Surrey, can have a glass of Cornwall, uh, which is geographically where some of these wines are from. And I don't really like French terms like Bretagne, which I've seen used, we should be using something like that. I'd like it, not, not particularly against the French, it'd just be nice to have a, a British identity separate from Champagne. Um, and there's a, there's a movement to say that it should be called Merit. All English sparkling wine should have that as a name because it's a nod to our historical 
claim to making sparkling wine aside from champagne. One of the reasons we're so great at sparkling wine is the soils. The soil in much of southern England is the same as it is in northern France. It's the Paris Basin, which is a huge bed of chalk that runs under Paris, under the Champagne region, under the English Channel. It's most obvious at the White Cliffs of Dover where you can literally see the, the metres and metres of white chalk and the Sussex um, downs are all the same chalk underneath. Above that we also have huge seams of Jurassic limestone throughout most of central England and the Cotswolds, if you think of that lovely Cotswold stone. Those subsoils are all perfect uh, for making good quality sparkling wine and growing the grapes to make good quality sparkling wine. The climate is another thing that's really important for making good quality sparkling or cool climate wines across the board in this country. The south of England is currently one degree warmer than Champagne, always has been, but with global warming we're now the same temperature that Champagne was in the 1970s. So we've got that slightly warmer climate, it's very similar to Champagne, but more importantly in autumn we're actually a degree warmer than Champagne, so we've got a longer ripening period. So it's slightly different from Champagne, it's not exactly the same, but we do have that longer ripening period as well, which really helps. In Champagne the summers are quite short, so you've got to get the maximum sunshine and get it ripened as quickly as possible. The classic Champagne grapes are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. Uh, there's lots of other grapes grown in England as well, uh, some of which also make some good sparkling. Sauvage Blanc uh, from Breaky Bottom down near Brighton, that's one of the oldest uh, sparkling wines made in the UK right back in the 70s. It's great wine, proving that Sauvage Blanc isn't all raw cabbage. Uh, there are also, also grapes like Madeleine Angevine, Reitensteiner, Silvana, um, Muller Turgau, which is really dying out, it's a very unfashionable grape these days. For reds, Dornfelder can make some quite attractive wines, and Rondo, again, it's, it's more about colour, it's not really as good as Pinot Noir, but uh, previously when our climate wasn't quite as warm, it made some respectable reds, if not quite world class. The best still wines we have here are made from the classic grapes, which make sparkling wine, and they also make some of the world's best still wines as well, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Bacchus, for me, is a very typically English grape. I would argue it's our indigenous grape. It just smells of England, of hedgerows and meadows. Um, but I'll, we also make some great wine from other mutations of the Pinot Noir, which is Pinot Blanc uh, and Pinot Gris. We make some fantastic whites from those as well. It's often overlooked that the first people who took the plunge to really plant on a big scale uh, after Salisbury Jones uh, Hambledon estate really fell into disrepair and started selling off its grapes was night timber in Sussex. Many people forget that it was actually started by a couple from Chicago. Uh, everyone focuses on it as being the first proper English vineyard. They still account for about 10% of production in the UK. They're huge in comparison to many other smaller scale producers. Lots of them are catching up. The last time I was at Hambledon they were planting acres and acres and acres of new vines. So they've got lots coming on and there's loads of others coming on as well. It's a really exciting time for English wine, but for me it was night timber that kick-started the sparkling wine revolution. It now accounts for 70% of our production. The rest of it is still wine, rosé, red, mostly white. After many years in the doldrums, as I mentioned, Hambledon was bought out and replanted with the Champagne grapes, Pinot Noir, Meunier, Chardonnay. Uh, and this is their classic cuvee. And for me, it is historically very important, the Hambledon vineyard, but also very symbolic of what's happening with English wine at the moment. It's a very light 12% alcohol, it's got a lovely mousse to it, even just from pouring into the glass now I can just smell that lovely bready yeasty aroma that all comes from the second fermentation and a lot of time spent on its lees before it's disgorged. We've talked about the champagne traditional method before so I won't belabor it now. A few years left on its dead yeast cells gives it that lovely bready yeasty aroma that's just jumping out of the glass here. There's also primary fruit here, lots of citrus and blossom, a lovely honeyed note as well. There's a real ripeness of fruit here. Everyone who thinks that English sparkling is really stalky and green and lean, this is a beautiful wine. It's probably had the malolactic fermentation as well, which is what gives it that buttery, creamy aroma and finish. Really beautiful, a world-class wine. And in terms of, not to belabor the point of comparing it constantly to Champagne, but price point, this is the same price point as at the cheaper end of the Grand Marc Champagne houses. A fantastic value wine, I think. If you were to draw a horizontal line through London, most of the vineyards are south of that line. Uh, the southeast, which is Sussex, Surrey, Kent and Hampshire, account for three quarters of the production, so most of it is concentrated around there. Uh, the West Country, Cornwall, Dorset, Somerset, about 13%. Wales, only 1%. 
It's a little bit too cool and damp in Wales, but there's some lovely little shelter spots that make some really good wine. Tattinger and Pommery, two iconic champagne houses, uh, now have vineyards in the UK. Tattinger's Domaine Evremond, I think, are releasing their first bottles next year, possibly the year after. So the French, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that it's showing confidence in the fact that they think what we're producing is, is good quality. So they're investing in, in English vineyards, which is, for me, only a good thing. Moving on to still wine then, the Bacchus I mentioned earlier, um, this is an example from Kent. This Bacchus, as I mentioned, is one of those crossings that was bred in Germany. This is a crossing of muller with another grape, which is not recorded, which was itself a crossing of Silvana and Riesling. So you've got all of these sort of cool climate grapes in here. Uh, and it's not just that it suits a cool climate, it actually really doesn't suit a warmer climate. I've had examples that, uh, that have been grown in warmer countries or from England when you've had a particularly hot summer. And those lovely fresh green aromas become quite tropical, but not in a good way. It becomes almost like f tropical fruit punch. It's, it's really quite unappealing. It really suits being made in a low alcohol, really fresh way. Now, a lot of people say, because it's got that herbaceous element to it, that it's England's answer to Sauvignon Blanc. And for me, that's unfair because I personally don't really like Sauvignon Blanc. I find it's got a really rasping acidity, uh, really nettily green character. I like that it is what it is. It, it's got a very distinctive personality. It's just not for me, whereas this, for me, it, it's much more appealing. It's a great aperitif wine. Uh, it would be perfect with Whitstable oysters if you want a local food match for it. Um, and it's a lovely, light wine and very, I think, quintessentially British. And sticking with still wine and red wine, moving across to Kent, uh, we have here the Rabbitol Pinot Noir. Now this is made by an English couple, the Simpsons, uh, who spent a lot of time in the south of France and they decided to come back and sort of reinvest in an English vineyard. Um, it's on a heavy seam of chalk. Uh, this is the Rabbit Hole Pinot Noir. A lot of English red wines I've had before, I would really have rather they just made a good rosé out of it. Um, and a lot of reds are almost rosé. They're that sort of almost like Alsace Pinot Noir, they're that sort of halfway house where they're not quite a red, not quite a rosé. Can be appealing, but a lot of them I found are a little bit stalky, a little bit green, which for me indicates that it's just not ripe enough. Whereas if you press the juice and made a light rose out of it, you would get a more appealing wine, I think. This is not that at all. This is very English, but also, for me, it's got bags of fruit, bags of character. It's very typical Pinot on the nose. It's got that lovely sort of crushed raspberries, very fruity. There's a lot of ripeness now. There's nothing green I can get about it. It's got freshness, it's got acidity, but it's not lacking in abundance of fruit. It really has, again on the palate, lovely bags of fruit, lovely acidity. This would be a great wine with spring lamb, absolutely perfect wine for this time of year in the spring. Now, although I've talked a lot about um, the chalk and the limestone soils that we have here, that's not all there is in the UK. We've got green sand, we've got clay and clay marl, all of which can produce and do produce really good wines. It's not all about the soil. Uh, there's a lot of debate about it just because champagne is made on limestone it does, and chalk. It does not mean that that is the only good soil for grapes. Um, the Gusborne Estate. You may find it useful to try the Simpsons Sparkling Rosé against the Gusborne Rosé because Simpsons, as I mentioned, is on a seam of really deep, well-draining chalk, whereas Gusborne are on quite heavy clay. They're really just above the Romney Marsh, not that high above sea level. Uh, heavy clay, not that well-draining. Uh, looking at it, I think you'd be insane to plant a vineyard there, and yet Gusborne is one of the best sparkling wines we've produced in the UK. So it's, it's interesting if you ever do get the chance to try them side by side to see what you think as to what the soil has imparted to the character of the wine because they're really not that dissimilar in style. I hope you've enjoyed tasting these wines uh, and hearing about them from the UK because I think it's quite an exciting time at the moment. It's not just that we're planting a lot, we're actually getting more established vineyards now. Some of them have been around for about 20 years. So the quality is really starting to come through, not just from the vine age, but from the experience of the winemakers who've all sort of gone through Plumpton College and I think we're seeing some fantastic wines. I think we are the newest New World wine area. If you think of when the first plantings went in in the 50s and most of that has been replaced, uh, we are very, very young, but I think we're riding on the crest of a wave at the moment and the future can only get brighter. So thank you for tasting these wines with me. I hope you've enjoyed them.